Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. We just wanted to open up the room a little early and allow for everyone to settle in. Thank you for being here with us. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. For those who just jumped into the room, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. We will get started in just a minute. Please feel free to settle in and I like the hellos and the good mornings and the chat. We'll get started in just a minute here. Okay, well, we are at the top of the hour and we do have a lot to cover today. And so we will officially go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're happy to be here today to discuss the intersection of suicide prevention infrastructure and behavioral health services. This is a national learning session that is brought to you through a collaboration from the MHTTC Network and the Suicide Prevention Center. Just really quickly want to say that the opinions that are expressed in today's session are those of the individual speakers and do not reflect the official position of our funder, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. On the next slide here, I just want to provide a really quick introduction to the MHTTC network. Um, for those of you in the audience who have not worked with us before, for those of you who are uh, uh, familiar with MHTTC Network and our services, welcome back. Um, the MHTTC Network develops and disseminates resources and provides training and technical assistance and delivers workforce development opportunities for the mental health field. We have 10 regional centers and a network coordinating office that make up our network. You can see our centers are spread out across the country on our colorful map here. I invite you to visit our website, mhttcnetwork.org, to learn more about the center that serves your region. I also encourage you to visit our website so that you can learn more about all of our free upcoming training opportunities and access all of our products and resources that we have available for you across numerous mental health topics, including, including suicide prevention. And again, all of these trainings and events, products and resources are available to you the mental health workforce uh, free of cost. A few gentle reminders before we jump into uh, the meaty part of our session here today. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the session using the Q&A box. We hope to have some time at the end of our session today to address as many questions as possible. We are recording today's session and we will share the recording and the slides with all attendees within the next day or so. We will also provide certificates to attendees uh, by the end of the week. I thank you all again for being here today to learn more about the intersection of suicide prevention infrastructure and behavioral health services. Now, without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker, Jana Bucock. Uh, Jana is an MSW and a senior prevention specialist on the Suicide Prevention Resource Center project. Jana's primary experience includes managing the implementation of suicide and substance use prevention programming in South Dakota communities. Jana received her Master of Social Work in 2021 from the Arizona State University and is a certified addiction counselor and certified prevention specialist. In addition to her state and community-led prevention experience, Jana also has experience working with youth and adults experiencing behavioral health disorders within the community. Welcome, Jana. Take it away. 
Thank you so much for that introduction, Jess. I'm so um, excited to be here with you all today to share a little bit more, not only about the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and the work that we support with states and territories, but also where behavioral health providers kind of fall into the intersection of our suicide prevention infrastructure in our states and territories. Uh, very similarly to the Mental Health uh, Technology Transfer Center Networks, we are also funded by SAMHSA, so therefore the opinions, uh, views, and um, content expressed in this product do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of CMHS, SAMHSA, or HHS. For those that are not familiar with SPRC, we are the only federally funded resource center devoted to advancing and implement the implementation of the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. Uh, for those that are not aware, SAMHSA actually just released the 2024 updated National Strategy and the newly released Federal Action Plan. So if you're not familiar with that, I would highly encourage you to go take a look at that. It's a very exciting time in our field to kind of have that call out for federal agencies to have a stake in suicide prevention as well. Before I dive into the content today, I do want to take a second to do our land acknowledgement. Uh, so we acknowledge that the land that now makes up the United States of America was the traditional home, hunting ground, trade exchange point, and migration route of more than 574 American Indian and Alaska Native federally recognized tribes and many more tribal nations that are not federally recognized or no longer exist. We recognize the cruel legacy of slavery, slavery and colonialism in our nation and acknowledge that those people whose labor was exploited for generations to help establish the economy of the United States. We honor our indigenous, enslaved, and immigrant people's resilience, labor, and stewardship of the land and commit to creating a future founded on respect, justice, and inclusion for all people as we work to heal the deepest generational wounds. A little overview of what we'll be covering today. So I'm gonna talk a little very briefly about the state infrastructure recommendations, which uh, create the basis for our state and territorial suicide prevention needs assessment. And then we're gonna talk about where behavioral health fits into the um, state infrastructure, as well as um, some key data that might be of interest to you all as behavioral health providers. And then we'll talk a little bit about call to action, as well as share an example of what this infrastructure looks like in the field and how it does end up um, helping to prevent and reduce deaths by suicide in the nation. Uh, before, though, we dive into the content, I want to know a little bit more about where you all are joining us from. So if you don't mind whipping out your phones, or uh, I know Jess is going to dr uh, drop the link in the chat for you, to go to this Menti uh, page, and you can enter the code, or the QR code will take you right there, please enter the state or territory that you're joining us from. I'd love to kind of see uh, where we got a lot of people from and, and see where everybody's joining us from. I'm going to pull that up right now. Oh, Guam, wonderful, welcome, California, Missouri. And so as people enter in the same states and territories, they'll get bigger too. So that's kind of the cool part about this word cloud. Washington. And also, I can't forget District of uh, Columbia. So if you're from Washington, D.C. as well, please let us know. Michigan, Missouri. Fargo, North Dakota, close to me. I'm in South Dakota. Wonderful. Lots of Michigan folks in Minnesota and North Carolina. I like it. Ooh, Las Vegas. I was just in Las Vegas for the American Association of Suicide uh, Suicidology Conference a couple weeks ago. Very, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of, I had some good times there, though. I will not lie. North Carolina, New York. Love it. Wonderful. All right, this is really cool to see everybody tuning in across the nation. I love it. Wonderful. If you want to keep entering in there, please feel free. We still got a lot of people left, but Kansas, Hawaii. Thank you. Very early in Hawaii, I believe. So thank you so much for being on this morning. Appreciate it. Wonderful. And very early in Guam, right? Or is it late in Guam? I I'm not the best uh, with the time zones, but thank you so much for being on today. I appreciate it. All right, so going back to our slide, thank you so much for entertaining that. I'm glad that worked well. That was my first time using Menti, so it looked good. 
All right, now we're gonna do a little bit more interaction again too. So before I dive into the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and a little bit more about what SPRC does, I have a poll question for you all. And I wanna know how familiar, how familiar are you with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and what we do? So Jess, if you don't mind pulling up that poll, so let me know how familiar are how familiar are you with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and what we do. And Jess, when you think we have a good amount of people, I'll let you uh, stop it and share the results, and I'll be interested to kind of see where people are at. Good. I think we're getting there. 70% have participated. Okay, let's go ahead and end and let's share. All right. So we got, wow, quite a broad, broad representation here. I like it though. Never heard of it. Heard of it a little bit. No little, no a fair amount. No, well, wonderful. I like it. I like that we have a broad range. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jess. So for those that are not familiar with SPRC outside of what I've already shared in terms of uh, supporting the national strategy, uh, very similarly to the Mental Health Tr Technology Transfer Center, we have uh, various teams that support professional development among various professions in the suicide prevention field. Uh, so my team specifically is the state and territorial initiatives team, and we work with state and territorial suicide prevention coordinators to implement suicide prevention from the state and territorial level. Uh, this also includes supporting their infrastructure development uh, to create sustainable suicide prevention programming. We also have a community initiatives team. We have a territorial initiatives team. Oh, sorry, a, a tribal initiatives team. I apologize. Uh, we have the lived experience advisory committee, so where we really center suicide-centered lived experience. Uh, we also have a health initiatives team, so that's where any of the free zero suicide work falls under is our um, goal uh, as our healthcare initiatives team under SPRC. Uh, and then we also have a belonging um, initiatives as well. And then we also have the best practices registry. And so for those who have maybe been around in the field for a while, you're probably familiar with uh, SAMHSA's former NREP. Um, I was in the field when that kind of went away at the state level, and now we have a resource uh, registry. Uh, but SPRC launched about a year ago our best practices registry, which includes uh, evidence-informed uh, curriculums that are specific to suicide prevention, as well as tailored to different audiences. So that would be something I definitely um, highly check, recommend you check out. We also have tons of free uh, self-paced training modules, uh, virtual learning labs on our website, as well as this is where you can find contact information for your state and territorial suicide prevention coordinator should you want to connect with them further after this. So and I'll be happy to show you all how to find that contact information at the end. So what are the state and territorial suicide prevention recommendations? The recommendations, Sorry, um, the recommendations are what we'd use to help state leaders assess the status of their current suicide prevention infrastructure. Uh, this helps them identify gaps and needed resources to improve the foundation for suicide prevention in their state. Uh, they can also be used to identify engage and partner partners, uh, support the development of action plans, and build a strong infrastructure to support and sustain suicide prevention efforts. Lastly, they provide a framework for a public health approach to suicide prevention, encouraging states to regularly examine the current extent of suicidal behavior, evidence-based prevention efforts, funding, and personnel in order to identify and address needs. Uh, so as a former state suicide prevention coordinator for the state of South Dakota, uh, what we had when I started there was we had federal grants. We had no state funding to support suicide prevention. Um, and that's where some of many of our states and territories are still in the example, uh, are still in that state now where they are using just federal funding to support suicide prevention. And unfortunately, that's typically time limited. And it's also very specific as to who that target audience is for that funding. And so one thing about state infrastructure is one of the core components is getting state funding dedicated to suicide prevention. This allows flexibility for states and territories to reach their populations most at risk, as well as provides for sustainability, right? So if it's in the legislature, if it's in law, then it can't change with leadership necessarily. It can't change with funding streams necessarily. It sticks in there. So it creates a good sustainable foundation for suicide prevention. Uh, as for the working definition, a state's concrete practical foundation of framework that supports suicide prevention related systems, organizations, and efforts, including the fundamental parts and organizational parts that are necessary for planning, implementation, evaluation, and sustainability. 
So to create the uh, six essential elements of the infrastructure recommendations, SVRC conducted a thorough literature review and environmental scan, as well as consulted with experts from 21 states and national organizations. We also held focus groups with state suicide prevention leaders and solicited focus feedback from specialists in the state government and those personally touched by suicide. We've also released a number of related resources and success stories related to the tools of implementation, and we'll be sharing one of those at the end of today's presentation. So as I mentioned, there are six essential elements. This is uh, all of them. We have authorize, which is really about having dedicated staff and state funding. We have lead, which is um, having some dedicated leadership for suicide prevention, as well as um, training them in the competency in suicide prevention. We have partner uh, because I'm sure you all know we cannot do this work alone. Um, oftentimes it does fall on the state uh, suicide prevention coordinator. So those partnerships are very vital to carrying out suicide prevention programming. Uh, we have examine, which is really looking at the impact of the efforts that we're putting our funding behind or the, the where we're tailoring our efforts to. So we know, is this working? Is this not working? And can we adapt it? We have build, which addresses a multifaceted but also lifespan approach to suicide prevention. And then we have guide, which supports uh, all of our states, territories, and communities um, really going down to the ground level uh, and supporting that work being done. Because while the state su uh, might support it at the, the state level, right, with funding, it's really the people on the ground in the community, you all, that are doing the work that helps us prevent uh, deaths by suicide. So now diving into a little bit about our state and territorial suicide prevention needs assessment. So what we have is an annual suicide prevention uh, evaluation of the national progress in achieving those six essential elements that I just shared. Uh, we just uh, are actually currently collecting our 2024, which is our fourth annual state and territorial suicide prevention needs assessment. The due date is actually today. So if you're a state coordinator on this call, just a friendly reminder that the due date for submitting your data is today. Uh, but what it does is it helps us understand our national competencies, development, and gaps in suicide prevention infrastructure. It helps to obtain information to inform our technical assistance to states and territories, and it provides information to states and territories about their progress in developing suicide prevention infrastructure. So the scores that um, come in, the only scores that we share nationally or publicly are the national progress scores. We do not share individual state or territory scores uh, nationally or publicly. I should say, we give that back to the state or territory so they have it so they can help um, inform their efforts. And then as a prevention specialist, I work with my portfolio of states or territories to maybe work on one piece of their infrastructure every year to help advance that. Uh, this was our de dissemination of the SNA for 2023. So we invited a lead in each for a lead in suicide prevention from each US state and territory to participate in the SNA. Uh, in 2023, we actually had the best participa participation we've had to date, which was uh, a 40, 91% uh, or 49 to 54 states, territories, and the District of Columbia participated. So it was really great. Uh, so those that were highlighted in blue submitted a full response. Those that were highlighted in white did not, uh, did not submit a response at all. Um, not to bore you with a bunch of data, or how the data is collected. But just to show you that uh, the assessment includes questions, including a Likert scale. Uh, we have multiple choice questions. And then we also have open-ended questions that solicit uh, barriers and challenges and successes in the infrastructure um, within each essential element. So this is the scoring across the six essential elements. Uh, typically, we find that build is always the highest rated essential element, and that is potentially because it's also the largest uh, potential area for points as well. So just keeping that in mind. Um, but yeah, uh, build is also where a lot of the strategies live and where the work that the people are doing on the ground uh, is scored. And so in terms of our results for 2023, uh, the blue bars show our 2022 progress, national progress scores, and then the green bars show our 2023 progress scores. We don't have 2022 in here because we did have some uh, question changes from 2022 to 2023 that impacted the ability to do um, trend data. I had to think of the word. So that's why you only see 2022 and 2023 here on the screen. Uh, what you'll see is we growed, we grew, growed, we grew in every essential element except for authorize. Uh, we do have some thoughts as to why authorize went down, um, particularly maybe 
people not understanding some of the questions. We also had did some clarifying questions around funding. Uh, we used to just ask in the first assessment, do you have state funding? And people didn't understand the difference or didn't differentiate between state and federal funding, right? Because federal funding comes to the state, they divvy it out. So we did do a really uh, important job of differentiating between state and federal funding, and therefore that kind of helped differentiate that as well. So we weren't too alarmed necessarily by authorized going down. Uh, what I really do want to highlight is examine has always been our lowest rated essential element. So that's a data component um, doing our impact evaluations, quantitative and qualitative. And we've seen that grow um, 4% over one year was just pretty fantastic. We've done a lot of work behind our examine essential element over the past couple of years at SPRC to really build uh, the evaluation capacity of our states and territories. So we're really excited to see that. But overall, our total progress scores stay the same from 2022 to 2023. So in terms of why is this relevant for you all as behavioral health providers, where do I fit into this? I wanna kind of pose that question to you first. So again, we're gonna do another mentee. So if you will go ahead and pull up your phone, um, Jess will go ahead and drop that link in the chat if you'd rather do that as well. But if you'll go ahead and go to that page, I want to know, where do you all think your work may intersect with suicide prevention? Where do you all fit into the scope or the continuum of suicide prevention? And I'm going to pull up that mentee now so we can look at that. Everywhere. Tell me more. Bridging gaps in infrastructure. We fund suicide prevention programs. Absolutely. Great. Prevention, funding, the community, behavioral intervention, prevention work, increasing 98 capacity. Yeah. Okay. Delivering lessons at the high school level, helping design curriculum, scope, and sequence. Uh, you can also vote um, on if that's, if somebody put something in there that you already agree with or something, you can also, I think, should be able to vote too if you like that, but QR trainings, prevention, assessment. Yeah, but assessing for the suicide risk. Wonderful. Advocacy for change in schools for younger kids. Yeah, that's been a really big uh, conversation that I've had uh, locally. I work part-time for a community mental health center. And, you know, some of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, youth are taking their lives younger and younger. So it's really interesting um, that you say that because I think that's such an important thing as well. Building public health approaches preventing suicide. Education, direct intervention, absolutely. Policies and assisting with implementation, love that. Maybe you're taking assist, uh, delivering safety planning uh, with clients, you work with kids, intake assessment, or working with the justice impact population, absolutely. Yeah, implementing the zero suicide framework. Yep, I'm currently working with our community mental health center to implement that as well. Wonderful. Rural support. I And I, I really appreciate you sharing that too, because as in central South Dakota, I am in a very rural part of our state uh, where resources are not necessarily scarce, but they're uh, spread apart, right? And so access and supporting our rural uh, individuals is really important. Ooh, liaison to suicide prevention coalitions. That's cool. Collaborating with local behavioral health agencies uh, for referral and easing communication for risk management. Love that. Very good. Screening referring college students. I, I really love that as well. I think our collegiate population is a very uh, missed opportunity in the suicide prevention space at times. So I really appreciate you sharing that. I also think our college age youth are those um, 20 to 24 year olds who are 18 to 24, I should say, that aren't in college and they're in the career path, they're also a missed opportunity that we have to kind of work on more specifically reaching them. Social work with persons who are at risk for or have STDs, HIV, or hepatitis. Very good. This is all really good. Doing QPR training. This is wonderful. I really appreciate you all taking time to kind of put this in here. I'm seeing a lot of attending uh, suicide prevention training, offering suicide prevention training, doing risk assessments, doing safety planning with those at risk, serving those populations that are known to be at higher risk for suicide. So that's really great. Thank you so much. Let's turn back to our slide. Right, so uh, meant 
mental behavioral health, right, intersects with suicide prevention in a variety of ways. So for those that are probably familiar with this, most of you probably are, the spectrum of uh, mental, emotional, and behavioral interventions, also formerly known as the continuum of care, is a helpful tool in identifying where and how substance misuse prevention, suicide prevention, and um, mental health treatment and promotion also exists. What's interesting, right, is that when you look at substance use prevention, it goes from promotion to prevention. When you look at substance use treatment, it starts at treatment and goes to maintenance. When you look at suicide prevention, or sorry, behavioral health treatment, it goes treatment to maintenance, right? Uh, when you look at suicide prevention, it actually spans the whole continuum. Um, so we are really looking at lifespan approach. We're looking at the full scope of prevention all the way to postvention, because when we know is that postvention or supporting those that have lost those at risk, or sorry, supporting those that have lost somebody to suicide is prevention because they are not at higher risk because they've lost a loved one to suicide. Uh, the social ecological model, right? You guys are all probably familiar with this as well. So all people have biological and psychological, psychological characteristics that make them vulnerable to or resilient in the face of potential behavioral health issues. Uh, because people have relationships within their communities and the larger society, each person's biological and psychological characteristics, characteristics exist in multiple contexts. So there's a variety of risk and protective factors associated that operate within each of these contexts. These factors also influence one another. So we know that targeting only one context when addressing a person's risk or protective factors is unlikely to be successful because people don't exist in isolation, right? So when you are working with individuals in the community, you're not working on just one level. You're probably looking at, or you're not treating everyone that you work with the same, right? You're looking at them as an individual level uh, within their relationships, within their community, and within society. What are the things that are impacting them? What are the things that are putting them at higher risk versus things that are protecting them, right? Or keeping them um, from the risk. So we have individual level, which includes our personal attributes, characteristics, beliefs, and attitudes and behaviors. We have our relationship level, which is our family, our friends, coworkers, uh, teachers, neighbors, our, our close associates. We have our community, so our hospital systems, our uh, mental health uh, systems, our schools, media, um, organizations, you know, our community outlets, our activities, things to do in the community. And then we have societal, which is our social and cultural norms and governmental policies that affect health behaviors and healthcare. Um, some key points to take away from this as we move into um, circumstances that increase risk, but also protect for suicide risk, is that suicide is rarely caused by a single circumstance or event. It's typically multiple contexts or factors that contribute to somebody wanting to take their life. Uh, but we also know that many factors can reduce risk for suicide, and we also know that everyone can have a, a role to play in helping to prevent suicide, should they want one. So there are a range of different factors, again, at the individual, relationship, community, and societal levels that can increase suicide risk. These factors are situations or problems that can increase the possibility that a person will attempt suicide. So I'm not gonna go through all of these and these. this is not an exhaustive list. There's definitely more in my notes that I could not fit on the slide, but these do come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So if you're interested in uh, seeing more of them, but a lot of these probably overlap with people that you're working with in the community, right? Having a history of depression and other mental illness, maybe having substance use. We know that those that use substances uh, have a higher risk of um, dying by suicide losing a loved one to suicide or losing a relationship, being bullied, right? We know that that presents a high risk for somebody for suicide. Lack of access to appropriate um, health care, whether that's mental health care or physical health care, discrimination within the community or historical trauma. And then society, right? The stigma associated with uh, help seeking or getting help for your mental health. Unsafe media portrayals of suicide and of course, easy access to lethal means of of suicide among people at risk. So making sure that you know, we have secure storage to prevent that. And then of course, similarly to risk factors, we have a range of factors at the individual relationship, relationship community and societal levels that can protect people from uh, suicide. We can take action in our communities and as a society to support people and help protect them from suicidal thoughts and behaviors through some of these pieces. Um, so at the individual level, we can teach effective problem or uh, 
problem solving or coping skills. So for the people that said that they're in the middle schools or they're working with the college age students, right? Looking at the reasons for wanting to live um, and also culture, having a strong sense and strong connection to our culture can be a protective factor. In terms of our relationships, having support from our partners, friends, and families, feeling connected to others is really huge, as well as feeling connected to our community. So that goes into our community, right? Feeling like we belong in our community, that we're welcome, um, as well as our school and other social institutions. And then, of course, on the opposite, in terms of lack of access to healthcare, availability of consistent and high quality physical and behavioral healthcare. As well as societal, we have our cultural, religious, or moral objections to suicide, and then we have reduced access to lethal means of suicide among people at risk. So again, this list is not exhaustive. If you want to see all of the uh, risk factors and protective factors, um, I do have a link at the end of the presentation to where this data comes from. And you're more than welcome to check that out more, but I'm sure, again, more, most of you are probably very familiar with these as well. Um, and then where else does your work fit in in terms of suicide prevention? So social determinants of health, right? These are the conditions and the environments uh, where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and the age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. We have more and more evidence to share that social determinants of health can be directly tied to suicide prevention or to suicide, I should say. And most of the strategies that we have to prevent suicide based on the best available evidence and with the greatest potential to prevent suicide most often involve approaches that have policies, programs, or practices that overlap with social determinants of health. And something that we're doing at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center currently is we have a closed uh, an annual community practice that we host for our state and territorial coordinators to really build their skill in a certain area. And this year we are focusing on social determinants of health and how can suicide prevention address some of these social determinants of health? Uh, how can state suicide prevention offices work with other partners? How can they directly support these efforts? Uh, because we know a lot of these are tied to people dying by suicide. So right, um, economic loss, economic stability. So loss of a job, loss of a loved one is suicide. Did that? Did they lose their uh, partner who is the maybe the person making the most money in their you know in their um, family? Can they still afford their housing because of losing somebody? Uh, those kind of pieces. Um, ac access to quality education, right? Um, our social and community context, again, so discrimination, racism, those pieces. Having access to affordable house care, housing as well, right? And then again, healthcare quality and access, of course. So again, like I mentioned, a lot of the strategies that we have for end suicide overlap or address social determinants of health in some way. And so there's a great correlation there, which we're trying to build some stronger sense among our state and territorial suicide prevention leads so we can support that because we know that training to be aware of you know people at risk and just screening isn't necessarily going to prevent every death by suicide right it's not going to do all the work for us and so we have to look at the other areas that are impacting people's lives that we can help address to to make sure that they stay here So what are some key findings from the state and territorial suicide prevention uh, needs assessment that might be of interest to you? That's what we're gonna go to, going to go into now. Oops, did I skip? So, so sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so a few states actually reported having funding in place to support prevention efforts that address social determinants of health. So just as we were talking about social determinants of health and those underlying causes uh, that may contribute to suicide risk, few states are actually doing work or funding work that supports addressing social determinants of health. Um, so when you look at these, these are the state emphasis on addressing high-level suicide prevention strategies. So it's really not super surprising that identifying and assisting those at risk is top level, right? I think all of our states and territories do a really great job at supporting uh, community helper training, which we would formally call gatekeeper training. That's been a shift in our language recently. Uh, but that's the QPR, that's ASSIST, Mental Health First Aid, Youth Mental Health First Aid, right? I, nobody's denying that we're doing a really great job at teaching people to be able to talk about mental health, recognize uh, when somebody's at risk for suicide, and getting them to onto help. Uh, we still, of course, are working on increasing uh, help-seeking behavior, but the other things that kind of fall to the wayside, right, are a crisis support system, uh, are ways to create community connectedness, of course, secure storage of lethal means. 
um, our care transitions and transitions and linkages from our inpatient hospitals to our communities, um, enhancing life skills and resilience. Uh, postvention is a great area for growth as well. And I think that's something where we'll see we're focusing a lot on in the next couple of years. Um, and then of course, addressing social determinants of health, which is, this is part of why we decided we wanted to talk about social determinants health in our community practice this year. For those social determinants of health that are being addressed by uh, state suicide prevention coalitions or offices, the majority said they're addressing ACEs, which makes a lot of sense. There's been a lot of federal funding behind the intersection of ACEs, overdose, and suicide prevention. So it makes a lot of sense that that's where a lot of the funding is going, but that's what most of our states and territories are doing. But starting to help them seek and, and think a little bit more outside the box in terms of what else could they be doing creatively. So I had a state or territory ask me about do they think their office could support, support like a community garden? And it's like, yes, absolutely. That is not only a social trauma health, but it's a community connectedness factor. It also addresses uh, food insecurities. So yeah, you could definitely make the case for that. So starting to have them think outside the box of those other things they could be supporting or doing. Uh, in terms of uh, populations at risk that states and territories are trying to reach through some targeted efforts, uh, most are reaching our military population, our youth age 10 to 17, 18 to 24, and our, our adults. I think this is also, again, very telling of where our federal funding lies. Um, and that is, we have a lot of funding in terms of the governor's challenge to supporting our military and veteran populations. We have our Garrett Lee Smith grants that support our youth age 10 to 24. And we have our national strategy for suicide prevention federal fundings that are addressing right 20, um, 25 and up. So this is a lot of where our funding, our federal funding is coming from. So this is another reason why having state specific funding to support suicide prevention is important because while we know nationally, these populations are a huge risk, right? And we know that, is it necessarily the case in your state or territory? Is that what your data is sharing and making sure that you can appropriately reach the those that are most at risk within your state or territory is very important. In terms of crisis uh, services, I felt like you guys might be super interested to hear more about this, but respondents were asked what crisis services are represented in their state's infrastructure. Almost all states have call centers, but comparatively less than less have chat services, mobile crisis support, or residential crisis and stabilization programs. In terms of the coordination of those crisis services, it's not particularly strong, uh, with only 40% of states and territories having coordination in place between all these certain types of crisis services. So when somebody calls 988 and we have to facilitate you know, a, um, a commitment or involve law enforcement, maybe some communities have a mobile crisis response team that 988 can dispatch versus law enforcement, but maybe they don't. So that's a great area for growth, just an example of what that might look like. Um, and then in terms of progress towards developing funding for crisis services, states and territories were asked to identify the level of funding for 988, mobile crisis, and residential stabilization crisis services. While the majority uh, have 988 services in place, or 72%, fewer had mobile crisis services in place, and even fewer had residential stabilization or programs in place. I know this is a huge thing for us in South Dakota. We have two, um, right, two, maybe three, two two inpatient psychiatric hospitals in the state of South Dakota, and they're on the far end of our state from where I live. Um, and so one thing that we're trying to do and move progress towards is having residential, um, regional residential crisis stabilization beds. So number one, we're not sending people four hours away and we can keep them closer to their community and we can get them stable um, a little bit quicker and back into the community as well. So definitely something we're looking at here. Again, that's speaking from my, my part-time work, not necessarily my full-time work with SPRC. In terms of the strategies that most uh, communities want support and consultation on, 65% uh, say they want help with identification and assistance of at-risk groups, but only 4% want help addressing social terms of health. And I think that just in terms of, again, what we know about suicide, what we know about suicide prevention, and a lot of it comes down to training, right? Training to identify those at risk, training to help those, get those at risk to the appropriate help. But I think we're starting to see that we know that suicide prevention goes a lot deeper than just identifying those at risk and getting them to appropriate help. We know that we have to start addressing the context 
um, that they live in to help them um, to start preventing suicide more effectively. Um, and then kind of lastly, in terms of types of support the states and territories provide to communities at least annually, uh, nearly all respondents reported providing guidance on best practices or providing ongoing technical assistance to communities offering either trainings or conferences or providing state level data on suicide. We have actually fewer respondents that reported providing local or regional data. Um, we have some that provided fewer provided local, excuse, fewer, fewer were providing just uh, summoning news or providing guidance on strategic planning or providing funding opportunities. So what, in terms of what your state and territory is offering, that's very gonna be specific and individualized to them. And so it's definitely something I encourage you to reach out to your lead after this call, if you're not already connected. And again, I'll hopefully be able to show you with enough time uh, where you can find their contact information. Uh, okay, really quickly, before we move into the priority areas, I kind of want to hear from you now that you've heard some of those um, findings. What are you more interested in learning about within your state or territory? So I'll have just you've got the pull up. Perfect. Thank you. So what key findings most interest you that you'd like to learn more about within your state or territory? What are you interested in knowing more about what your state or territory is doing and how can maybe you be involved? So we have those high level suicide prevention strategies, social determinants of health, select populations being reached, uh, the core elements of effective crisis services, including their coordination and funding, and then the types of support available to communities. So I'll let uh, Jess take us and kind of get people's responses in. Perfect, thank you. I love it. So we have a little tie up in top in terms of high level suicide prevention strategies and social determinants of health being addressed by suicide. I appreciate it. See, I told you all the tide is turning. We're, we're learning that it's more than just identifying people at risk. So thank you so much. So from every state and terror suicide prevention needs assessment we do, we come out, oops, sorry. Uh, we come out with some priority areas that we want to focus on at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and we want to support our state and territories in. So from the 2023 uh, SNA results, we identified three priority areas for actions. Uh, these can be promoted at the national level by public and private partners, and then states, territories, and communities can also help spread the word on the importance of these priority areas and identify action steps to take at the local level that will help to address these three priority areas over time. So strengthening representation of diverse and underserved populations in suicide prevention efforts. This means having the people that are most affected by suicide at your table, having them involved in your planning efforts, having them involved in the strategies that you select. And that's from the beginning to the end, not just bringing them in the end, but really having them embedded throughout the process. Uh, priority area two is building state and territorial capacity to address underlying conditions associated with suicide risk factors. So this is where social determinants of health come in and where the, the community practice that we're currently supporting is really looking to enhance their knowledge. And then increasing state and territorial capacity to evaluate suicide prevention efforts. Uh, one thing I've noted with my team, especially as a former lead, is that a lot of our evaluation efforts are driven by our federal grants, right? And the people, things that we have to report to the federal government as part of getting those federal funds. So our, our evaluation infrastructure was really established by them. So, or sorry, by that. Uh, so that includes like number of people trained, uh, number of people screened. And so starting to support our states and territories and thinking deeper and how can we monitor the impact that we're having in a more meaningful way versus just people served and people screened, but rather, you know, what else are we seeing? The, the past students, you know, having thoughts of suicide, what programming are we doing that we can monitor that with that a little bit more better? So how can we monitor and evaluate our efforts in a more impactful and meaningful way? Um, and then in terms of how you can support the development of suicide prevention infrastructure, uh, we have, these three uh, key resources, but three kind of different areas that you can do, you can read the full state and territorial suicide French needs assessment if you're interested. We also have a high level uh, report as well. You can coordinate with your state or territory's uh, suicide prevention agency to learn more about your unique needs and strengths in suicide prevention. 
Uh, you can use our infrastructure webpage to guide the development of infrastructure in your state or territory. And really, sometimes when it comes down to you, you might be the people that need to advocate for those needs within your state or territory. And you can take steps to formally support the development of sustainable suicide prevention infrastructure. So being the voice that maybe the state folks can't be because they're limited with what they can share at the kind of state level. Okay. That was a lot of content that I just threw at you. We're going to take a second. We're going to watch a video. It's about six minutes long about how suicide prevention infrastructure in a specific state or territory led to the reduction in deaths by suicide within them. And so what I want you to do, because I'm going to ask you to report this afterwards, is I do want you, while you're watching the video, to write down key three takeaways you have from the video or key, three, three key steps that the state took to implement infrastructure um, in a meaningful way, sustain efforts in their partnerships. So we'll go ahead and get started. So when I started uh, at the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health in the state of Utah, uh, we had no dedicated uh, personnel uh, that were specifically working on suicide prevention. It wasn't in our uh, state plan spelled out, and it wasn't in uh, our directives to our local authorities, our subcontractors, our county providers, and uh, we were among the fifth to eighth highest state in Sorry. suicide deaths. Um, and we knew that, you know, for every death, there were a lot more people who were making attempts and who were thinking about suicide. You know, when we looked at the lives lost and the impact that that was having on families and communities, uh, we decided it was time for us to take action and put together uh, a plan and a vision get the infrastructure in place to address it. And so uh, when we said, okay, we're going to do something, everyone was interested and everyone came together uh, to work towards a common goal to reduce suicide in our state. And we took a kind of field of dreams approach where we uh, said, if we build it, they will come. And we had some early adopters who uh, decided to really investigate the tools and the interventions and the vision that we were creating and uh, it, it took off from there. Our local mental health authorities, our county-based public system providers uh, dovetailed their suicide prevention efforts with their Medicaid uh, PIP, their performance improvement plan. And then we also worked with some of our public uh, and private um, systems, health systems, and they uh, caught this vision as well. Uh, our two largest provider systems, Intermountain uh, Healthcare and the University of Utah Health Network, both have dedicated suicide prevention staff now inside of their healthcare systems as well from this uh, state led movement of really focusing on what is needed and how to do it and how to implement it. We also now have a, a dedicated person in our medical examiner's office who uh, just looks at suicide. The important thing about having infrastructure in place is that uh, those people are going to be focused on it. It's not going to come and go with fads. It's not going to come and go with uh, changes in leadership, with, uh, you know, inside the governor's office or inside the legislature. When you have infrastructure in place, you're really able to focus on the problems and really able to develop good plans that can address the issues at hand. And so getting the infrastructure in place, um, that survives any of us. Uh, that survives all the elected officials and all the appointees. And uh, you're able to see the long-term effects of that work. And uh, we've gone from a budget of really 
nothing specific to suicide prevention. If you start adding up all of those staff and then all of the projects and the, um, and, and the programs that they operate, there's about 40, a little over $40 million in our state system going towards suicide prevention and uh, risk and protective factors that we know help with other prevention efforts as well. Uh, for the last two years, we've seen a decrease in uh, the rate per 100,000 of our suicides in the state of Utah. And it's because we have the infrastructure in place that has been developed uh, through partnerships with uh, so many people. So, uh, you know, the, the SPRC recommendations really help uh, operationalize what it is you need to do. And we've been able to take uh, parts out of the operations and out of the infrastructure recommendations and uh, add them to recommendations from our own uh, Utah reports and our own Utah data to make compelling cases to uh, the governor's office, to the legislature about the need for uh, the resources that we have uh, this last session, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, our legislature prioritized uh, crisis infrastructure for uh, receiving centers that will directly uh, reduce our suicide rate because people will be able to walk in and get help. When you start talking to survivors of suicide loss and you start talking to people who have lost loved ones, it's, it doesn't take any time to change hearts and minds to say this is something we need to focus on. And then finding and looking at the recommendations and the, the structure that is provided by SPRC uh, with the guidelines uh, really gives you a clear path to create uh, what you need to address suicide and create suicide prevention that is infrastructure that's just going to make a difference in people's lives. Perfect. All right, hopefully you all were paying attention because I'm going to test your knowledge now. Uh, if you'll again join me in mentee, I'd like you to document uh, what is one key step you heard Utah take to build their suicide prevention infrastructure. Why, why was that important? Maybe you heard that as well. So I'd love to hear that. We'll pop on over to Menti. Thank you, Jess, for dropping that in the chat. Maybe. There it is. All right, one key step, community-based providers, yes. It's been a big uh, push I've had recently, too, in terms of not only um, from my SBRC level, but at the local level, that we have to put some of that effort and the funding into our, our local communities because they are the ones that are truly doing the work that's going to make a difference in our state or territory. Medical examiner's offices, yeah, so um, great partnerships in terms of identifying uh, some root causes to suicide within the state. Identifying key people who focus on this topic, absolutely. Lots of partnerships, uh, speaking with families with lived experience, absolutely. Um, involving those survivors of suicide loss is so important when we talk about the efforts that we want to implement. Talking to families, absolutely. I saw that in the chat. Thank you, Elizabeth. A significant funding investment. They did have a significant funding investment. They did, um, which they were able to advocate through using the infrastructure recommendations to make some of those asks, right? <laughs> Build it and they will come. I love that, William. Uh, collaboration at multiple levels, behavioral health personnel, and private health offices. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, working with public and private institutions for learning. Absolutely. Uh, what I love about what he shared was that really, you know, with the funding and the, the legislature that went in and, and that's going to stay, it's going to be sustainable and it's going to be impactful for the long term versus coming and going. Um, those positions will be sustained. So they're not coming and going with grants. They're not, I mean, people may leave their positions, right? But the, the position will be there and will be stable. So 
I'm sorry, Elizabeth, you're having a hard time. I know Jess put the link in the chat if that works better for you. Adding positions to Medicaid, medical examiner's office, private and public health, absolutely. Uh, so while I am in here, please feel free to keep putting these in if you want. I can um, export these and share them with Jess. Uh, so Jess can share them out with you later if you'd all like. Uh, but one thing I wanted to drop and just share you visibly on our website before we hop off and do, I think we only have one question right now, but um, when you go to sprc.org, a couple resources that um, will just help with today's kind of information. So under effective prevention, you'll find we have strategic planning. We also have a strategic planning course that's self-paced if you're interested in that. Our keys to success are a comprehensive approach. Uh, and then this is where you'll find the state infrastructure recommendations that we spoke about today and the um, SNA that measures the progress in that. In addition, if you are so pumped up after this presentation that you want to go connect with your state and territorial lead and see what's happening in your state, I know just the place to show you where you can find them. You can go to organizations and then states. And then right there, you will find all the individuals who are designated to carry out this work. So I know um, I saw people from Michigan and I actually just met Lindsay in person a couple weeks ago. She's very wonderful. So reach out to Mich uh, Lindsay in Michigan if you haven't already connected with her. Find out what's going on. So um, yeah, I'm really great. Uh, yeah, I can put this direct link in the chat. You got it. One second. And then, Jeff, did you put the SNA? I don't know if you had the SNA link, um, but I can put that one in the chat too. Ooh. This is where you can find more information on the state and territorial needs assessment if you're interested as well. So. With that, let me pull my slides back up again. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the time uh, with you all today. I know we had one question somebody had asked to me to repeat the language of the gate, the language replacing gatekeeper training. So that is community helper training. Um, and I'm happy to share a little bit more information behind that change with Jess so she can share it out with you guys all afterwards. Um, it is some language that came from our lived experience advisory committee and our uh, belonging committee. It came out of discussion on our um, listserv exclusive to state and territorial leads that gatekeeper has a very negative connotation associated with it. And so we wanted to really strive to find something that's more appropriate and acceptable. And so the language that you know our, we are proposing, SPRC proposing is community helper training. And so again, I'm happy to share more information as to that reason why um, behind it and share that with Jess so she can share that with you all. But if there's any other questions, would love to hear more. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, I'm happy to share about that switch with you all so you guys have that. Ooh, loving people want to see the data. Just do you want me to move? I can kind of wrap up slides in terms of while we get that. Yeah. So again, I just want to remind everyone that we are sending um, the slide deck and a session recording, as well as your certificate of attendance by the end of the week, hopefully by tomorrow. Um, and I am hoping that you all will find this information helpful. Once you start diving into it, you will have the links to the resources that Jana mentioned today in that slide deck. Thank you again, Jana. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and being here with us today. I do ask that everyone submit your feedback for this learning session. When you close out of the Zoom webinar window, you will be automatically directed to our three-minute survey on your web browser. We really appreciate your feedback. And again, certificates of attendance, if you stayed on for at least 50% of our session today, you will receive a certificate of attendance by the end of the week. And we will have the session recording and slide deck. And if Jana shares with me the Mentimeter results and some of the other resources that she directly referenced in her session today, I can definitely link you all to those in that follow-up email you'll receive over the next couple of days. Again, this session was brought to you through a partnership from the MHTTC Network and SPRC. And so we hope that you'll stay in touch with us. 
We invite you to visit our MHTTC website. We have our email address there if you have any follow-up questions after this learning session. We encourage you to find your center uh, to connect to further free learning opportunities and resources. And I think that's it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. And again, oh, yeah. shout out, Jana. You're, you're awesome. Thanks. Somebody just asked where the eval will be located. Will they get it when they close out? Yeah, so they'll get it once they close out the Zoom webinar window. You'll be automatically directed to that survey on your web browser. Yeah. Thank you all for having me. It was really wonderful, so I really appreciate it. Awesome. My, my contact information will be on the, the slide, too, if you all want to reach out afterwards. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Jana, and thank you again, everyone. We hope you take care of yourselves. We appreciate you joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.